Hey, everybody. Um, hope y'all can hear me okay. Is there, can someone please type into either the chat box or the question box if you can hear me? Got a yes, great. Thank you so much. Um, I guess we can give it a few minutes while people are sort of rolling in, signing on, but welcome to Marine Invert ID Part 2. Um, my name is Shelby Wedlick. I'm with the Office of Resilience and Coastal Protection with DEP. My work focuses on looking at projects with in coastal construction or maritime industry and those that might interact with coral reef resources and seeing which ways we can reduce or minimize impacts. So very exciting um, work with lots of different intersections and a wide variety of tasks, some of which are interacting with lovely folks like you who want to know more about the marine environment. Um, today I have two um, I have two people with me, uh, my colleague Maurizio Martinelli and my um, new coworker Jessica Price. So Maurizio, I don't know if you wanted to say a few words about yourself. Sure, thanks Shelby. Um, hi everyone, my name is Maurizio Martinelli. Uh, if you join part one, you might recognize my voice a little bit. Um, so I work for an organization called Florida Sea Grant. It's part of the University of Florida's extension program. Um, we work to uh, we work kind of kind of across the state with coastal communities to help bridge um, the the any any distance that we see between management and science. Um, in particular, I work on coral disease issues in Florida. So you, you may have heard about a coral disease outbreak that's ongoing. Um, I help coordinate the statewide effort to respond to that. Cool. Thank you. And Jessica. Thanks, Shelby. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Um, as Shelby said, I uh, work with her at DEP. I'm in um, the Reef Injury Prevention and Response Team, where we monitor local uh, vessel traffic along uh, Southeast Florida's coastline, just to kind of monitor and make sure that nobody's accidentally or intentionally anchoring or grounding on the reef. And then if there is an incident, we uh, go through and respond to that and find ways to minimize those impacts in the future. And if anybody's interested, my awesome co colleague, Molly Sanat, is gonna be giving a presentation on that on April 22nd, where we'll go in a little more detail about our team and then the local CFAM team. So everybody tune in. Awesome, thank you so much. So um, just a few housekeeping things. The all attendees are muted just because there are 42 of us right now, it would get kind of unwieldy, but we definitely wanna keep this interactive as much as possible. So if you have questions, I already see a few of you typing into questions boxes. There's also a chat box and all of these presentations are being recorded and the awareness and appreciation coordinator, Michelle Gralty will be um, compiling all the recordings once Earth Month is through, and I think those will be posted on the website at a later date. So stay tuned if you want to go through the slides again, kind of refresh your ID skills, or just remember the corny puns. We are here for that. And um, all right, I think Maurizio and Jessica are going to be monitoring the questions. It's a bit hard for me to navigate that as I'm presenting. And we're going to try and stop after each group of organisms that we go over um, and maybe read through a few of the questions before we move on. So with that, let's get started. So Florida's coral reef extends for 350 miles um, from St. Lucie Inlet in Martin County all the way past Key West into the Dry Tortugas. Um, so that's the same length as driving from Miami to Jacksonville. It's this huge national treasure we have in our backyard. Um, and we just have a map here with some different designations for um, 
the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, John Pinna Camp State Park, Dry Tortugas National Park, um, Biscayne National Park, and then the northern third of Florida's coral reef is in an area called the Southeast Florida Coral Reef Ecosystem Conservation Area. So that's where all the creatures we're going to be talking about live and work and play. Just kidding, they just live, they don't work. Um, sorry, my slides are not advancing. Shelby, sometimes I had to click in the lower left-hand corner where there are two little arrows. Hmm, that doesn't seem to be working for me either, unfortunately. Let me close this and try again. Sorry about that, guys. In the meantime, if you could type into the chat um, where you're calling in from, what um, you're interested in, your favorite marine animal, would love to see all the answers. Shelby, I might also check if there are um, kind of random either animations or other things on the slide. I think I saw the little star that indicates the animations on this slide. Right, and I clicked and they didn't go through. Um, let's see if any other slides have that. A few others, but... All right, Simper Gumby, always be flexible. Um, hopefully that won't happen again, but if it does, I'll just click out and back. Um, so today we'll cover what we mean by an invertebrate and why we care, a simplified phylogeny of the animal kingdom, and then show um, ID of common Florida creatures in the phyla mollusca, annelida, euarthropoda, and echinidemarda. Um, hopefully by the end of this you'll know a little bit more about what that means and also why we care and then we'll of course have a very important quiz just kidding it's all for fun um so invertebrates are a very diverse group of animals um they include everything except the subphylum vertebrata so that's fish amphibians reptiles birds and mammals um invertebrates neither possess nor develop a backbone and that's 97% of all species, that's huge. So it's more useful to describe what isn't included rather than what is. Um, so today we're going to be talking about um, different taxonomies. And in some cases, I'll note that genera or genus, this tiny pink part of the triangle towards the bottom are even more diverse than the whole entire subphylum in this yellow portion of the triangle of um, vertebrates. So very diverse group, very hard to get into a couple hours. And there's a lot more that's not going to be covered today. So if you have any questions, definitely feel free to Google and explore and ask and just look at the weird and wonderful world of invertebrates vertebrates get all of the attention but there are some really beautiful intriguing simple but elegantly designed organisms here that deserve some of the spotlight too um and just a quick mention that these are found in the pacific but um just wanted to highlight some of these gorgeous patterns and the diversity of life that we have in the oceans. So now we'll walk through the very simplified phylogeny of the animal kingdom. Um, it's a high level description of how we group animals according to common ancestral traits along this evolutionary tree. So the whole kingdom can be traced back to some common single-celled ancestors 
We've then evolved, evolved multicellularity. Um, the sponges or the phylum periphera were the first to branch off. Um, they're relatively simple animals um, and they're unique in that they don't contain any true tissues or organs, only, only specialized cells. Um, then we have our cnidarians and our tenophores. Um, these are the phyla that include jellies. Um, and then we've also got roundworms and flatworms, mollusks, annelids, arthropods, kinoderms, and finally the chordates and the vertebrates that we won't be talking about today. So the sponges and um, flatworms and cnidarians and tenophores, those were all covered um, last week, last Tuesday. And now, today, we're going to go over the mollusks, annelids, arthropods, and echinoderms. Um, specifically, the thin-shelled mollusks, um, the segmented worms, annelids, and the joint appendage arthropods, and hedgehog skinned echinoderms. So we'll start with mollusks. Um, Mollusks are the largest marine phylum with membership under just one quarter of all named marine organisms. Overall, this is an incredibly diverse phylum in terms of the body plants, behavior, and habitat of its members. Due to its incredible diversity, it's hard to describe anatomically what unites all mollusks, but the three most common features are a fleshy mantle, so kind of the soft part of a snail or the inside of a clam, a hard tongue-like organ called a radula, but which can sometimes have little teeth on it. Um, and the organization of a nervous system. So they have some ability to sense things with nerves. We have um, a full-blown nervous system with a brain and neurons. Um, and they have that too, just in a more primitive sense. Um, they also mostly have calcareous shells and eyes, but the complexity of their eyes varies tremendously. So we'll start by talking about gastropods. Um, gastropod is only second to insects in the overall number of species in the class, and 80% of all mollusks are gastropods. So, this is the flamingo tongue, tongue, subnoma gibbosum, I believe. Um, they are a group of predatory sea snails um, known to some as false cowries. They feed, the flamingo tongues feed on soft corals by scraping polyps with their radula, that um, tongue with teeth on it. Um, and I mentioned that because you can find these guys often hanging out on gorgonians or sea fans um, just because that's what they eat. And so you'll often see sort of a little white speck with the um, orangish yellow spots outlined in black. And just for reference, this is what the shell alone looks like. So you'll notice all the colors are gone. They get that color from that fleshy mantle that they mentioned and that encapsulates the shell around it. And so this is what their um, skeleton looks like. And they're very small. Um, you can see the dime for scale. So if you're out looking, these guys are really tiny, good for um, sort of small scale photography. And then these are sea hares. Um, they're in the genus Aplesia. Um, they're called sea hares because they have two long appendages that look like rabbit ears. Um, and those quote unquote ears are called rhinophores and they're chemosensory. So they sense chemical signals in the water around them instead of sound waves or anything like that. Um, they have a soft internal shell and they're herbivores, um, meaning that they eat plants and they can range in size from a few centimeters to the size of a football. And my favorite feature is they squirt. Um, and they can swim. They use their fin-like flaps to get up in the water column and move around very quickly. Um, their ink discharges are purple and in some species it's a hot pink. 
And another fun fact about these, um, my alma mater is University of Miami, and they are doing a lot of work on the neurons of Aplesia because they are very large, and so they can actually use the neurons in Aplesia for research on um, Alzheimer and dementia and sort of get a sense of how their nervous system response can help us learn more about our own. So they're really cool organisms and I think they're kind of cute. So now on to nudibranchs. Um, nudibranch means naked lung in Latin. Um, they get their name from the exposed gills that you can see on the photos on the left. So um, in the top left, sort of in the back, you can see the branchy structure um, on the one in the bottom left. You can see sort of the branchy structure on the back. That's their exposed lung. Um, and then the Rhinophores are just like on the sea hairs. Those chemo chemosensory organs are also on the front. So those little antenna that move around help them sense everything in the water around them. Um, they have gas exchange directly through their skin and the prickly looking appendages on these different um, nudibranchs are known as serrata. So all known nudibranchs are carnivorous and feed on sponges, other sea slugs, eggs, even stinging organisms like hydroids or jellyfish. There's a really cool nudibranch I like called the blue glaucus. And I think Maurizio touched on this that actually eats on the manivore um, and incorporates those stinging cells as a defense system. So very adorable little white and blue sea dragon looking thing. And, yeah, deadly sting for things of that size. Um, so the top left is the regal sea goddess. Below that we have Olga sea goddess, and then we have a Flabellina species and crisscross Tritonia. But there are hundreds of these, so with lots of different common names. So if you ever have any questions, it's definitely fun to look up these different nudies and get a wide variety of um, of diverse shapes and sizes and colors. Um, some other sea slugs are the painted alicia and the lettuce sea slug. Um, it's kind of hard to tell on the scale, but these guys are really, really tiny. The painted alicia could fit on one of your fingernails and the folds on the lettuce sea slug can get so thick that you can't really see any of its body. Um, both of these slugs are herbivorous, and that is one way to tell them apart from nudibranchs because they do sort of have the rhinophores and other similarities. Um, and again, like I mentioned with the flamingo tongue, um, generally they'll be hanging out by some of the algae that they eat. And they are also like nudibranchs in that they can incorporate chemical defenses of their food into their skin. So if they feed on a toxic algae, they'll take that toxin and store it in their skin as a defense system. And so these bright colors warn predators away. And if you know the scientific name for that, bonus points for you if you mention it in the question box. Definitely keep an eye out. They're really, really colorful. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't include this gastropod in the presentation. So this is the queen conch, Lobatus gigas. Um, there's large, slow-moving snails that can live up to 40 years. Um, they live primarily in seagrass beds and they feed on algae and aquatic plants. Um, they have a very substantial shell, sort of the most famous shell everyone kind of pictures when they're thinking of large seashells that they're combing for on the beach, but they have a wide variety of predators that can get around that shell, including sea stars, eagle rays, nurse sharks, loggerhead turtles, and several species of fish, and us, unfortunately. Sorry, conch. Um, it's been an important food item in the Caribbean for a very long time, and their sh shells have been used for decoration, tools and ceremony, um, 
humans. And there's a long and storied history with how humans have interacted with the Queen Conch in the Caribbean and elsewhere. Next, we have um, cephalopods, and I'll go ahead and stop for a bit and see if we have any questions. Thanks, Shelby. Um, and folks, you can take this opportunity to add in any questions in the question box. Um, so one that came in is, how big can the lettuce sea slugs get? Those, um, let's go back. I think those are also just um, around the size of your nail marids here. You can correct me if I'm wrong on that. I'm not 100% sure. I think that they're they're relatively small. They are pretty small. I, they usually get a little bit bigger than the painted Alicia, but as you're saying, like they're they're pretty small. Um, they can get pretty bushy, which I think is more substantial than their length. Um, so it can, it can be really hard to see like the slug underneath all of those lettucey folds. Okay, cool. Did we have any others come in? Um, there's a question that we got an answer to. Um, it was, is 97%, is it that 97% of sea creatures are invertebrates or all animals are invertebrates? 97% of all, all animals. So you think about your insects also are invertebrates and they make up staggeringly large numbers, billions of insects everywhere. And a lot of times vertebrates get the attention because they're what we see and they're what we can relate to most closely, but it's also really interesting to see. Um, I don't know if any of y'all have checked out the documentary, My Octopus Teacher. It's um, got some really good cinematography and really good insight onto the fact that these animals, even though they are so different from us and they don't have spines or anything like that, um, octopi in particular have really advanced intelligence. And there's this interesting evolutionary question on how did they get to be so smart, even though they don't have some of the infrastructure we typically think of as supporting intelligence. So. You know, fun stuff to think about. Anything Very else? Very cool. Um, so there's one more that came in that was asking what was the term that you asked if the participants knew? Oh, that was yeah. aposematism. So that's when an animal displays warning colors, um, kind of similar to a poison dart frog that um, warns to stay away. So that's aposematism. And now you know. Great. <laughs> Great, thanks. I think that's all the questions we have, so feel free to feel free to go on. Thanks. All right. And PowerPoint's cooperating. Yay. Knock on wood. So now we'll go on to the cephalopods. Um, cephalopod um, comes from the Greek, roughly um, translating to head feet. Um, the Caribbean reef squid is the only species of squid commonly found on our reefs. So odds are if you spot a squid, this is the guy or girl, he's a squid. Um, they can generally get to be um, six to 12 inches long. Um, so about half a foot to a foot. They're most often found swimming in schools and sometimes you can see squid schooling with fish. The entire length of their mantle is bordered by um, a thin fin, which forms a point near the head of the squid. Um, the color varies, and at night they can show spots of iridescence. If they're disturbed, they can change their colors and pale and raise their tentacles um, as sort of a defense mechanism to look a bit bigger and their fins gain a really pretty gold tinge. Um, I love seeing these whenever I'm snorkeling or diving and definitely cool to watch them change colors. Um, sometimes that's a warning mechanism like, hey, you're getting too close. And then other times it's an effort to camouflage. It kind of depends. I've seen them go dark when, um, when people get too close and then I've seen them sort of blend into a, sandy color when they're swimming over sand. 
And so this is actually their, um, that dark color that I was mentioning. Um, they can also use the color changes to communicate with other squid. And they're um, able to communicate um, different color changes to squid on either side of their school um, by just changing colors on different sides of their body. So um, kind of like those people who are expert multitaskers who are talking on two cell phones at once. I can't understand that, but they'll do the same thing just with color changes. Um, the Caribbean reef squid is a lot less um, slim and streamlined than many squid, and they may be confused with the cuttlefish, but we don't have cuttlefish in Florida, so if you think it's a cuttlefish, it's probably just a very chunky squid. And so, kind of <laughs> jumped the gun on this one, but this is the common octopus or octopus vulgaris. Um, it's found worldwide in tropical, subtropical, and temperate waters from near the surface all the way down to 500 feet. Um, and due to their incredibly, incredibly wide distribution, um, they're a lot of people will think that they're actually seeing a different species of op octopus um but for now we're just calling it the common octopus um so from arm to mantle mantle is sort of the um part of their head i'm not sure if you can see my now mouse but um the sort of bad part of their head with the siphonophore that little hole there um from mantle to tentacle, um, they can reach up to three feet long, and they live up to two years, generally dying after reproducing for the first and only time in their life. Um, they're very smart, and they have a full complex nervous system. They have a central brain like us, but two thirds of their neurons are found in their arms. Um, and they have really dense nerve bundles at the base of each arm, so the arms can perform really complex motor functions independently without communicating with the central brain. And we've seen some instances where an octopus loses an arm and that arm still will move and hunt independently for a long time after the octopus is alive. So unfortunately, I don't know exactly how long, but... Um, and they're pretty territorial to other octopus. Um, even when trying to mate. And it's also kind of tough to describe octopi because their color and skin texture can change to match their surroundings. Um, so they're often reddish brown when not changing color and they have a warty appearance on their mantle. Um, other octopus species have a dark ring around their eye that the common octopus doesn't have. Let's see if I can back up so you'll see sort of the pupil there is a dark slit but there's no ring around the eye so that's another way to tell that it's a common octopus and they're nocturnal animals so the best way to see them during the day is to find their den so they will go out and hunt and then seclude um, into a nook to protect themselves because obviously they don't have a hard shell. They're vulnerable to predators if they don't hide. Um, so if you see a little like scraps of shells, that's just the octopus being a messy eater and you can tell like, okay, there might be a den here and poke around, look inside crevices. That's the best way you can see one unless you're lucky enough to catch it out free swimming. Alrighty. And so we'll end our section on the cephalopods with um, the bivalve. So this is the base scallop. Like all bivalves, they're enclosed in a shell that has two halves connected by a hinge. Um, they live in seagrass beds and near shore waters, and you can distinguish them from other bivalves by their really pretty bright blue electric eyes. Um, they're also able to swim. So you can see in the bottom right, um, it's kind of Everyone pictures them as they are on the beach, just sitting still, but you can see it swimming around, kind of cute. Um, they open and close their shells to create thrust. And while the scallops were once relatively common in Southeast Florida, they're a lot harder to come by um, just with 
urban development, habitat loss, uh, their populations have been brought down, but there are some pockets with robust populations along Florida's west coast, and there are still um, groups that do scalloping there, so you can still find them, and those blue eyes, that's what you want to look for, for those scallops. Any other questions before we move on? Yeah, Shelby, there was a question in the chat um, from Jasmine. She was curious to know, are sea slugs solitary animals? I would say so. Um, I don't really see them often in groups unless there's mating activity. Um, that's, that's mainly what I've seen is um, generally I'll only find one at a time. I don't know if um, Jessica or Maurizio, you have any experience seeing them out in the wild. I generally only see them on their own. Yeah, generally on the reef when I see them, they're they're solitary and that's just mainly because of their size. So they don't they don't travel far. Yeah, that's true. They kind of have their one little spot on the reef. Um, any other questions? No other questions, but Mary did make a comment um, that it's octopuses or octopodes, not octopi, um, Greek, not Latin. So ah, that makes sense. Yeah, fun fact. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. Yeah, I love these things because a lot of times I'll even learn something new. So thank you very much, Mary. Octopodes from now on. <laughs> Alrighty. So next step in our journey, uh, we have annelids. Um, so these are ringed or segmented worms. They live in marine, freshwater, and moist terrestrial settings. Common earthworms fall in this category, and most marine annelids are in a grouping called polychaetes, meaning many bristles. Um, and they live in a diverse range of marine habitats from the polar seas down to um, hydrothermal vents. Um, so they're some of the most temperature tolerant species in, in the world. Um, so here we have one polychaete is the bearded fireworm. Um, it gets its name from the large branch appendage on its head, um, sort of towards the upper right here, kind of looks like a beard. The segmented body has short tufts of white bristles and stalks of red gill filaments. They're commonly found in reef areas and when disturbed, they'll display display their bristles, um, and those bristles can puncture our skin and inject a toxin that leads to a pretty painful burning rash. Um, it's, we're too big for the toxin to impact us lethally, but it can be really, really uncomfortable, and um, definitely the general rule of thumb is don't touch things in the ocean, but especially this guy, not a good idea. And you can see in these photos, um, bearded fireworm eat corals. Um, they can munch away at significant patches of coral tissue in a single meal. Um, they're primarily nocturnal, but um, increasingly we've um, seen them in the daytime. So we're not sure if that's food shortages or increased competition or a lack of predators, but it's important to know for any coral restoration work that's going on, if corals are being outplanted, it's important to make sure that none of these bearded fireworms are nearby because that puts the coral at risk of being eaten. And then it's also important to look into them and see, okay, are they spreading any diseases between corals? How do they travel? Um, these are just up and coming questions that we need to consider as we're managing for coral reef health. And then we have the Christmas tree worm. Um, so the spirally shape of these Christmas tree worms are their gills. Um, as with several marine organisms, their gills play a dual role in respiration as well as in feeding. So this is also a polychaete worm and they're segmented but the segmented part of their body lives in a tube buried down in the coral head so on the left here you see um kind of this white tube you might be able to see my mouse as well um in the central part of the 
worm, that's the tube. And they're very sensitive to changes in water and light around them. It will often retract into their tubes if you get close, but if you hang around very still, you can see them and they're looking very festive as they filter. Um, and if you're looking out specifically for big coral heads, oftentimes Christmas tree worms will be burrowed into large coral heads. Any more questions before we move on to arthropods? Yeah, we just had a question come in um, and it asks, what is the name of the snail that feeds on corals? There's, so we had a bearded fire worm is um, what we had. And then there, there is a snail that feeds on corals as well. Um, I think, right, see it was a cone snail, right? Um, I honestly only know them as like the coral snails. Uh, the genus in the Caribbean is, I think it's uh, Corallophilia or Corallophila. Which um, makes in the, yeah. <laughs> um, and in the Pacific, I know that there are a couple genera. One of those, which is Drupella, um, but mm -hmm. I think they're commonly just called coral snails. Yeah, generally coral snails and um, corallophilia would um, be the Greek for coral loving. And I've also heard the term corallivores for coral eating. So generally, if it's something for or something philia, it either loves it or it eats it. <laughs> or both. I'm a taco for myself. And a quesadilla. Oops, oh, sorry. I was just gonna let you know, there's a couple more questions. Um, mm -hmm. This is from Medea. I believe she's referring to the um, Christmas tree worms, but asks, so how do they maintain this vibrant color? Is it from the diet? Ooh, that, that's actually one I don't know. Sorry, um, I, they're not, symbiotic so i don't think that it's something living in their skin it could be their diet or it could be a genetic change that might be a really fun last year when i did this any question i didn't know we waited until the end after the quiz and just did a google session together to learn together what the answers to some of these were so um jessica and Mauricio, if you don't know then maybe i would recommend hanging on for a google session Yeah, I honestly do not know. I don't know either. It's a great question. I'm telling you the wrong thing. <laughs> um, but along those lines, Bridget would like to know if the Christmas tree worm kills the coral. No. So they burrow into the coral, but I would say the burrow is only an inch deep and they don't tend to colonize over large areas of the coral. So coral heads are really interesting in the fact that some of the bigger ones, that structure attracts a lot of smaller organisms that don't end up killing the coral, but kind of use it as shelter or um, substrate. And generally for things like the Christmas tree worm, it's small enough that it doesn't affect the overall health of the coral. It's when you get things like the boring sponge that Maurizio mentioned last week that sort of compete with the coral tissue and take over large swaths of the colony, that's when you really need to be concerned. But these guys are in um, small enough numbers and only take sort of a small part of the skeleton. I think it's, um, it's sort of a neutral relationship between Christmas tree worms and corals. Good question. Anything else? Do you know how big crown of thorn starfish get from Layla? Good question, Layla. Um, I've definitely seen photos and video of them only about like a few 
like a couple feet across. Um, that is not something that we see in Florida or the Caribbean, though. It's um, it's mainly uh, found in the Pacific. But good question. All right. I think we can move on to another highly diverse phylum, Euarthropoda, um, which we often sometimes call just arthropoda. So U is um, the little moniker of true. Arthropods, um, Euarthropoda means jointed feet, and they comprise over 80% of all described um, species, uh, which are terrestrial most of which are terrestrial. You have your crabs, insects, centipedes, spiders. Um, all arthrop arthropods have an exoskeleton, a segmented body, and paired jointed appendages. Um, and due to their rigid exoskeleton, if an arthropod wants to grow, it will have to shed its full exoskeleton and molt in order to then emerge. And um, you'll see, like, if you're familiar with um, Crabs, you'll see like a soft shell crab and a hard shell crab. A soft shell crab is just one that's going through that molting process and needs to grow and form that exoskeleton. So the largest subphylum of marine arthropods are the crustaceans. These include little ocean critters like brine shrimp, ostracods, and copepods. Um, you probably won't see these much during the day, but at night, if you leave your light on, you can see a lot of these tiny creatures zooming around. And that was actually my first night dive ever was in um, was in Bonaire. We knelt at, in the sand and turned our lights on and there was an ostracod um, inning display. And it looked like I was just kneeling in a field full of stars. Just these blue lights were everywhere. It's really beautiful. Um, but we're mainly going to focus on the Malacostraca class today. Um, these include prawns, shrimp, krill, lab, crabs, lobsters, and all of those. Um, this is the largest class of crustacean. They contain about 40,000 species, 40, species. The unifying feature of all these animals um, are their segmented body plan with a head, a thorax, and an abdomen, all of which are organized with bilateral symmetry. And first up, we have the banded coral shrimp. Um, they can grow to be up to seven to 10 centimeters long. Um, that's just a few inches. Um, the body is translucent, translucent, sometimes with a pink tinge, but with pronounced white and red bands across the body and first legs. Um, and they have little short spines on their legs that they use for defense mechanism. And they have really large forceps or claws. Um, these claws can break off easily, but they do regenerate. So sometimes if you see shrimp with different size claws, it's because one broke off and then it grew back. But obviously it's got to take time before it gets to the size of the fully grown claw. Um, they have four white antenna that are generally twice as long as the body. And that can be really useful if you just see some four long, white, thin lines, maybe get a little closer to the rock or the coral head, and you can see some of these um, banded coral shrimp. And underneath their two large claws, they have a pair of legs with smaller forceps that they use to clean fish and eels. Um, it's a bit hard to see, but if we zoom in, hopefully you can see the second set of forceps that they're using to clean off little parasites, bits of skin, um, and this is what they feed on. Um, and because of this cleaning behavior and their red and white striped body, another common name for the banded shrimp is the barber shrimp or the barber pole shrimp. There we go. Now we can see those little, little forceps. Next, we have the Peterson cleaner shrimp. Um, these cleaner shrimp, shrimp have transparent body and legs covered with purple spots and two pairs of long white antenna Sometimes rows of pinkish eggs can be seen attached to 
the female and that definitely helps with how small these are and how translucent they are they can be pretty hard to find they live in association with a variety of anemones um like the corkscrew anemone that Maurizio talked about last week um they sit on or around the anemone's tentacles and sway in the current and basically are trying to attract fish to clean um if you're really brave and really patient you can hold out your fingers next to these guys and sometimes get a free manicure out of it i've definitely had times where i hold my hands out and um little shrimp will come and pick pick off dead skin but the shrimp has to want to do it you can't just go shoving your hand places you have to be patient um so can you all see the shrimp in this photo Give it a little bit. For those who couldn't, it's right there. So really tiny, really good at blending into their environment. Next up, we have the Caribbean spiny lobster. These crustaceans have relatively long cylindrical bodies that are covered in small spines. And then the horn looking appendages on the front of the animal, um, are often longer than the main body. So if you are looking for lobster, a lot of times you'll look for them in rubble and see the antenna poking out before you see the main lobster. Um, and these antenna are used for sensing prey and its environment. Um, lobsters are primarily nocturnal um, and they live in reef areas where they can find food cover um, underneath rocks or large corals. At night, they'll emerge from their crevices to hunt for food, um, primarily small mollusks, but they can also scavenge on dead organisms. So unlike the main lobster, the Caribbean spiny lobster lacks those large front claws. Um, despite that, they're very popular food um, in Southeast Florida. And it's the most important food export in the Bahamas and the Florida Keys. And both commercial and recreational lobster uh, fishermen and fisherwomen um, will seek these guys out. There aren't any stock numbers available, but Florida does close this species to harvest from April through July to protect the animals during their mating season. And then finally, things are getting creepy. Um, we have isopods in the order Arthropoda. Isopods can be found in most habitats on Earth, but they share a common body plan with an oval body formed by overlapping plates and a fan-shaped tail. So the isopods pictured here are parasites. As juveniles, they swim around trying to find a host, and once they find a suitable host, they settle for life, often losing their ability to swim. So they're highly dependent on that host for survival. Once they're attached to a host, they scavenge specks of floating food from the water. And while many species attach to the outside of a fish, there are a few that actually take the place of a tongue on the fish, as pictured here. So they eat the tongue and then hang out in the tongue spot, but they get the pro of this is that they get closer to the food this way, but the con is that if they grow too large, they inhibit their host's ability to eat and lead to their own demise. Which, I don't know, if you eat someone's tongue, maybe you deserve it. <laughs> All right, echinoderm time, but first questions. Any questions? Yes, um, there are a couple questions here. The first is, what are those blood worms that swarm my dive light during a night dive? Oh, that's a good question. Um, maybe if you type in some things like length, color, that can help us with some potential ID. Uh, I admit I only know them as blood worms. <laughs> that's kind of what I was thinking. I was like, that's definitely the common name. Not sure the um the scientific name. Excellent question for the Google session at the end. 
Um, all right, and then there's a question, are the isopods related to chitons? Yeah, they're very similar. Um, I think that they are. They're, they're also arthropods and they're in that same sort of order. Good question. Oh, we're actually getting a correction. Chitons are mollusks. Yeah, so they're here in the phylum mollusca. Yeah. Um, this question, do you know how big a snapping shrimp can get? Um, I think that they can get to be about the size of your... Are you talking about the... There are shrimps that... Um, our snapping shrimp that we didn't cover that can get up to be about the size of your hand. The Peterson's shrimps and the banded coral shrimps we covered from before um, only get to be about a few inches long. All right, um, there's a great comment here saying that, oh no, that's going too far, isopods. I think referring to some of that uh, Parasite behavior. <laughs> um, oh, and a I think a clarification about the bloodworms, uh, they're about a half inch long and there are millions of them. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't know if you know more, Shelby. Yeah, I, we just refer to them as bloodworms usually. I know they're, they're annelids, so they're these segmented worms, but that's about all I got for you. Yeah, and then snapping shrimp, I'm seeing a clarification here that the snapping shrimp can get up to 30 centimeters. Yeah, and that's part of why we introduced the session this way is that there's so there's so much that's known about the vertebrates and we have this um, really, really large knowledge gap about the invertebrates. So even though this is my field, there's obviously still things I'm learning. Great, thanks. All right. <laughs> yep, I think we can move on. Okay. So, echinoderms. Um, echinoderms usually have rough or bumpy skin, and so their name is derived from the Greek words for hedgehog and skin. Um, hedgehog skinned, and their um sort of defining feature is that they have um. Most of them have five point radial symmetry. So as you can see, the sea star is a great example of this. This is the largest phylum of invertebrates that's exclusively marine. And the vast majority of echinoderm species are benthic, meaning that they live on the bottom of the seafloor. Many echinoderms also have really incredible regenerative capabilities. Many will self-amputate and regenerate their arms and even their internal organs for different reasons. So if they need to escape from predators, um, sometimes as a mean of, means of asexual reproduction or cloning, um, and the removed arms can sometimes develop into an independent thing, but most of the time it needs to be split in half. I actually read a really interesting case study in the Pacific where there was a problematic starfish that was affecting oyster populations. And part of the way that they discovered that the sea stars can divide and expand was that they, um, would fish for the sea stars and call their population to try and help the oysters by cutting them in half and throwing them back in. And then the population doubled and they wondered why. And it's because um, it's because they have that ability to regenerate. Um, so four classes of echinoderms we'll discuss today. Um, we have Asteroidea, Ophiuri, Ophiuroidea, um, Echinoidea, and Holothuroidea, um, sea stars, brittle stars, sea urchins, and sand dollars, and sea cucumbers. So one of the most common sea stars you'll find is the cushion sea star. 
They're notable for their really thick, heavy bodies and short, stubby arms. The spines um, dot the top of their bodies um, and form net-like geometric patterns, and that can kind of help differentiate them from other sea stars. They get fairly large, um, with adult cushion sea stars growing to be over a foot long at their longest axis. So this animal is an omnivore, and it feeds on algae, sponges, and small invertebrates. Um, it generally eats by raking together heaps of sediment and then turning its stomach inside out to engulf that mass of um, sediment and algae and other things and digest all the organic matter found inside. And they also scavenge on dead organisms. So in that case, they'll find the part of the body that they can fit their stomach around and just turn their stomach in inside out and dive in. I'm really glad we don't eat that way. <laughs> Next we have the reticulated brittle star. Um, if you're into aquariums, you'll see these a lot of times in aquaria. Um, like sea stars, brittle stars have a central disc and five legs. Um, their legs are very long and thin and distinct from that central disc, um, kind of lending to their brittle appearance. They're pretty tiny. Um, the central disc can only grow to about 15 millimeters in diameter and the legs max out at around um, five inches, sorry for the meters to standard <laughs> conversion there. Um, they're all a white sandy color and their legs have brown bands that um, start at approximately the fourth joint. Um, underneath their arms are thousands of tiny little tube feet that they use to move around. Um, so they live in sandy or rocky areas. Their color helps them blend in with their habitat. Um, and they're primarily herbivores that feed on diatoms. Um, they're a small, small algae. Next, we have a giant basket star. Um, this is the same class as the brittle star we just saw, but it's much, much, much larger. So this is one of the rare exceptions to that five point radial symmetry rule that I listed earlier. And giant basket stars actually have eight legs and they're not very symmetrical. They're kind of crazy, remind me of some Kingdom Hearts villains from when I was little playing video games. Um, during the day, you'll find giant basket stars coiled up in tight balls, um, hiding among the branches of soft corals or sponges, like you can see with that rope sponge on the left. And then at nighttime, they'll unfurl their arms to form a big net, trying to catch plankton, like the copepods and the ostracods that um, briefly touched on earlier. And one by one, It'll bring those arms back to the mouth that you can see in the middle with the plankton that they've caught. And so that's, um, that can be a really cool thing to see if you get the opportunity to on the night dive. Um, and fully extended one leg on these basket stars can be nearly two feet long. Um, and if you go into deeper waters than are on the reef, they can get up to five feet long, those legs. Um, I've never seen one personally, but they're on the bucket list for sure. So now we have um, a really important anaderm is the long spine urchin or diadema antelarum. These small urchins live on coral reefs throughout the Caribbean, hiding in crevices during the day and emerging at night to graze on algae. They have many long, thin, and sharp spines. They're usually this jet black color. Sometimes you can see them with grayish or whitish spines. Um, and they're usually uh, 10 to 12 centimeters in length on the adults. These spines can very easily um, puncture and break off in the skin, causing a pain, painful wound. And the embedded spines also give off a purple dye. So don't be this guy. Don't pick them up. Don't play with them. That can hurt them being out of the water, hurt you, you get stuck. 
everyone has a bad day, don't do it. <laughs> um, and these urchins are critically important to coral reefs because they are herbivores. They will graze on algae and grazing on algae frees up substrate for um, coral larvae to settle on, which I think you'll hear more about in some of the marine invert ID classes on corals. But in 1983, this species underwent a massive die-off with more than 97% of urchins in the Caribbean dying off due to an unknown disease outbreak. So part of the problem with that is that algae maintenance system is now much diminished and so slowly but surely we're starting to see these urchins come back um we're some scientists are working on trying to rear them in captivity for later release so that they can go back to performing that ecosystem function of helping with the algal competition and creating space for more coral settlement so give them a wave if you see them say thank you and don't touch them <laughs> And this, um, these are just some photos of the urchin tests or their little body um, not with the spine is called the test. And so that's sometimes you can see on the beach if you see like sort of that round structure with the little rows of circles, that's um, the body of an urchin. And to the right, you see healthy ones, which is what we all hope for. Um, next up, we have the slate pencil urchin. Um, these urchins have thick cylindrical and blunt spines, which um, can be covered in different algae, but um, the pink algae that's on their spines is a crustose coralline algae, and that's a really beneficial algae that helps baby corals settle and also serves as kind of a glue to glue parts of the reef together. Um, so these urchins can be found in high areas of crustose coral and algae and actually back in the days when I was working in aquaria with touch tanks, this is one of my favorite urchins to interact with because if they feel they have little sensory organs in between the spines that um, help them feed and um, help them sense things. And so in the touch tank, we would actually tell kids that you could, they could put their pinky very, very gently in between the spines and the spines would close together to give them a quote unquote hug. Really, they were just trying to see if the kid's pinky was food and then realized it was too large to eat. But it's a lot more adorable if you say it's giving them a hug. So that's what we stuck with. Um, before we go on to our sea cucumbers, our final organisms of the day, do we have any questions? Thanks, Shelby. Um, there's a question here from Jasmine. Do urchins have eyes? Because in one of the pictures, there are two tiny glowing spots. They do, they're very primitive though. And so it's just sort of a light, dark sensing. And I think that it's, um, there's sort of multiple little spots. It's not, it's not like us where there's two highly developed eyes. There's sort of multiple sensory organs that detect light and dark. Does that, does that help answer your question? Chazin says yes. Thanks, Shelby. Um, another question, is that a fireworm on the urchin? I think it's related to this pencil urchin. Um, oh, sorry, let me go back. No, I think that is, um, so part of their test is, um, or their urchin body is a little bit, um, more vibrant than some of the other urchins. And because their spines are so stubby, you can kind of just see further apart. So no, that's um, that's just part of the urchin. That's how it looks. And that would be really intense because if that were the case, there would be three. 
three fireworms on it, that would be a very bad day for that poor little urchin. But no, we're sh we're showing a happy urchin in all its glory here. Anything else? Great, thanks. Yep, that's all the questions we have so far. All right, cool. All right, last but certainly not least, we have sea cucumbers. Um, they're criminally underrated. Uh, so there are a number of sea cucumber species um, here in Florida, including the two you see here. The individual on the left is, it's fitting, but it's unfortunate, <laughs> called the donkey dung sea cucumber. And um, the sea cucumber on the right is the tiger tail sea cucumber. So they have an important but not very glamorous role in the ecosystem where they break down detritus. Um, they're sort of like the janitors of the marine ecosystem. They pick up things like dead animals, um, sloughed off skin or scales, feces. Um, they scoot around these sandy areas and eat up all of this detritus that's mixed in with the sand. They'll di digest all the organic matter and then spit back out clean sand. Um, so at the back of the sea cucumber, you'll see the anal cavity or cloaca. Um, it's a single hole used for respiration, excretion, and reproduction. Um, and the only reason I bring this up is to mention a fun Pacific species of fish called the pearl fish associated with sea cucumbers that swim inside their anal cavity for protection. Um, and so you can see some of that here. And sea cucumbers are also known for their regenerative capabilities. Um, they can expel or eviscerate their own internal organs, um, primarily the digestive tract from the mouth and anus and regrow them. And their organs start to regenerate from both ends of their body whenever they do start that and essentially meet in the middle and fuse. So some pretty cool, pretty cool concepts there. Um, and sea cucumber populations um, in Florida and all over the world have been threatened by over harvesting. The, um, there's a bunch of demand in Asian markets for um, kind of non-mainstream medical practices. I will let y'all put two and two together on that and just say that we it's very important to regulate the um, harvest of these species and so we can enjoy their janitorial services and stop making fun of what they look like. Um, this was actually, I did a study abroad briefly in the Galapagos and there were some very interesting socioeconomic and ecosystem developments associated with the beginning of that sort of sea cucumber craze where there was such a high demand for Galapagos fishermen and fisherwomen to harvest these things and then sell them like crazy. And they were making so much money from this that they didn't really know what to do with it. And then they also had a lot of ecosystem setbacks because all of a sudden these, um, the reefs weren't getting that cleaning service that they need. So they started dying off and that's when they realized like, okay, we need to regulate the sea cu cucumber trade. The common name for them in the Galapagos is Pabino. Um, just a, sorry, a little aside there. So anyway, that's all the animals I have for you today. Um, we covered four phyla today. So hopefully now you know, um, if you see a mollusk, annelid worms, a uh, and a echinodermata, octopodes, as I've learned today, you'll know how to identify them. You'll know to appreciate them. And we have a quiz. So unfortunately, if we were in person, we could just call on each other and guess, but um, for now, just feel free to spam your answers in the chat um, or yell at your computer screen. I'll leave each photo up for 10 seconds and then the invertebrates will magically swim away. Okay. So 
for the first one, what is the common name? And is this a nudibranch or something else? Hmm. Seeing some responses in the questions. Give it four, three, two, one. All right, so this was a painted alesia. It is not a nudibranch, it does not have naked lungs on the back. It is a sea slug. All right, next up, what is the common name? And can you tell me anything cool about it? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Awesome! It's a Christmas tree worm, um, Spirobrinchus gigantius, and we learned, um, some of your saying this in the chat that they don't kill corals and that that spiral structure is their gills that's awesome good job guys all right they'll probably don't even need 10 seconds um what's the common name and how yummy do you think it is <laughs> i'm seeing some answers like very yummy delicious i agree Love them. Got to eat them sustainably, though. And y'all are right. It's the Caribbean spiny lobster. Um, I see a quote from Julie. More than crawfish, less than blue crab. All right, 10 seconds. What's the common name? Um, bonus points for the Latin name. I feel bad because I only said it once. But another thing, why do we like seeing this thing on our reefs? We have five more seconds. Seeing some really good questions, um, some answers popping up in the question box. And great, it's the long spine urchin, Diadema antelarium, sort of the lawn mower of the reef and helps with that algae management. Good job. All right, next one. This is the very beginning. So what's the common name and where might you find this gastropod? Think about what it eats or look at the picture. <laughs> All right, that is flamingo tongue and it's found on soft corals or gorgonians. Next up, what's the common name? Do you want to touch it? <laughs> Seeing some good answers come in. Danger, danger is right because it is the bearded fireworm. Um, so the beard is the sort of comes from the fact that they have all these bristles and as emperor cusco in llama form would say no touchy <laughs> all right next one It's just a Caribbean reef squid. It is not a cuttlefish. And can change its colors based on mood and communication. Really, really cool. All right, next up. Bonus points if you can tell me the name and what other sea stars it's closely related to. Five, four, three, two, one. 
Alrighty, this is the giant basket star and they're most closely related to the brittle star. Alrighty, so what's the common name for this invertebrate and what are the organs near its head that people say look like bunny ears? Oh, well, gave it away a little bit. Four, three, two, one. Yep, yeah. it's a sea hare, and the rhinophores are up at the front, and they're chemosensory organs. Saw a few of you who didn't remember what it was called, but you remembered what it did. So I'll give you points for that. All righty. What's the common name of this? slug like looking thing and is it a slug or is it a nudibranch? She's looking pretty royal to me. Maybe even divine. Things are going swimmingly for her. She's a regal sea goddess and this is a nudibranch so you can see the naked lung crowny structure in the back. Alrighty. Well, what's the common name for this bud? And will it give me a manicure if I ask nicely? Five, four, three, two, one. Banded coral shrimp or barber pole shrimp, um, lots of different common names. And yes, they are cleaner shrimp. They will clean and pick. Um, and now we've got our gloriously underrated friends. What's the common name? <laughs> Seeing some very inter interesting answers in the chat. And it's a donkey dung sea cucumber. All right. Um, so thanks again for tuning into the webinar. It was really fun geeking out with you guys. I'm sorry I did not know all the answers, but if you're curious about more organisms, you can contact me at the email listed. I am actually getting married Saturday. Super exciting for that. But so because of that, I might be a bit slow to respond. I'll be back in May. Um, but yeah, if you have any other questions, um, Maurizio and Jessica are also really friendly and presenting things. Um, Michelle Gralty is the coordinator who puts forth all the hard work bringing all these presentations together. So you can always reach out to her um, and you can reach out. Um, I think Florida's Coral Reef has a social media and you can also check out um, Southeast Florida Action Network. It's spelled S-E-A-F-A-N or CFAN. That's our DEP Citizen Science Monitoring and Reporting Program for the Florida's Coral Reef. So if you have a great day on the water, see beautiful things, we like data on that. If you see something wrong like an invasive species or harmful algal bloom something not quite right you can also report to that too and we'll help um solve the problem or get in touch with the right people to solve the problem all right thanks and i'll hang on for any last questions do we have anything Maurizio, jessica Um, I was distracted by most of the excellent answers to the quiz. Uh, I didn't see any. I will admit I was furiously trying to find an answer to what gives Christmas tree worms their color, and I could not find an answer. Um, I, it's a fascinating Let's question. I did. needs to get a marine science degree and find out for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there were some interesting papers that I came across where folks looked at the distribution of color morphs. So trying to see you know, if certain colors of these uh, Christmas tree worms, you know, were all in the same places or if they all were on the same kind of corals. 
but nothing that I saw that, you know, investigated why they're different colors. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, I'll pop the questions out. There were definitely some that I said I, I promised I would circle back to, and I don't remember what they were, unfortunately. I can peek back and see um, what I can find, but I also want to note a lot of people are telling you congratulations and good luck with the wedding. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yes, very exciting. So I guess that's another note that might not be my email by the time I get back. It might be um, Shelby Castali, C-A-S-A-L-I, instead of Shelby Wedlick. I think one of them was to follow up on the blood worm question. Oh, right. Yeah, we we can escape screen and do some creative Googling. So close that. We're looking for blood worm. Learn spell, Shelby. Okay. Looks like we're seeing some good videos. Just um, hopefully this is what you're talking about. I didn't see the actual question. Oh, here's a good. Night dive was full of polychaete worms, reef builders. Yeah, so I mean, again, I only know of them as the kind of common name of blood worms. They are polychaetes, which are um, a group of those annelids, those segmented worms. But I've exhausted my knowledge there. <laughs> yeah, it looks like, according to this article, they're found in the sand, um, sort of keeping in with the Latin tradition of. Polychaetes many hairs. Also, the labs look sick. The ads look okay, but just no. Um, let's see. Worms can, these worms come out of their burrows and swarm up through the water. Oh, okay, so it looks like um, maybe those aggregations at night are sort of mating activity um, or feeding. Um, looks like there's both kind of going on here. And you can play a part in the food chain if you want to. Um, seems like so corals will heterotrophically feed as well as rely on their algal symbiont spoiler alerts for any coral ID class. And um, sometimes if you do shine your light on a coral at night, the worms will be attracted to the light and it looks like the coral can then catch them with their tentacles. Um, I hope that answers your question. I think the fact that they live burrowed in the sand for so much of their life and they are so small and only come out at night underwater means that it can be hard to study them and sort of get more of these answers to these questions. But hopefully this helped a little bit. The site looks pretty reputable to me. Any other questions? We've got maybe five more minutes that I can hang on here. Um, none that I wrote down. Okay. Well, cool. Um, let me stop sharing my screen then, because nothing to see but a Darwin quote. <laughs> Um, yes, Shelby, it looks like you answered all of the questions that were in the chat. Awesome, cool. I think I think we're good then. Um, it's my understanding that I can stop recording and then we should be good to go. Thank you to everyone who stayed on. It was really fun um, for any of y'all that are still on to interact with you and learn more about marine inverts and talk about all of them.
and I think we're I think we're good. Was that it? Yeah, the only other thing I'll say is that um, to make sure everyone checks out the rest of our upcoming webinar series, I posted the link in the chat and in the questions box. So if anybody's interested, please check it out and see what uh, we have coming up. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jessica. And thanks, Maurizio, for also helping to field questions. You've got it. <laughs> I don't know how to leave. All right. Thank you. Bye.